and uh, that's good. Beams is about the missionary, and uh, so that's why when we do these conferences, we we like to we like to talk about the missionary, and we like to to invite missionaries because it's vital that missionaries, especially on the foreign field, know that they have a resource that they can get Bibles for their converts. Uh, and so I know we got some missionaries with us this morning, so. If these guys want to go ahead and come on up uh, and take three or four minutes, amen, repeat after me, all right, uh, if, you, if you come up as a missionary and go, take your Bibles, and no, we're not going to do that, okay, uh, but I would like for these guys to come up and just really take three or four minutes, introduce yourself, introduce your work, and tell us a little bit about where you're going. And let me encourage you also, go back to these tables, okay? Take a few moments to go back and look at these tables, look at these displays, and, uh, and meet with these missionaries. Get their cards, pray for them, and, uh, and, uh, and be, take, take some interest, okay? Uh, that's what this is about, taking the whole Bible to the whole world. So uh, if these guys go ahead and come up this time, uh, Brother Fox, Brian Fox, uh, Brother Bushy, if you'll come up, Brother Schnell, and uh, Brother Steele, if you guys don't mind coming on up and uh, try to give you guys an opportunity just to tell us what's going on and present your works. Go ahead, Brother, one at a time. Go ahead. I went to, on a missions trip in 2012. My whole world changed. If you see that little girl on my display back there, I met her in Tiwanaku, Bolivia, and we didn't have a, a, any scripture to give that little girl. Now, I don't know if any, any of you have been on the foreign field or not, but my mind changed. And now let me change your mind. Two seconds it took to change my mind as soon as I led into Bolivia. I can change your mind just as fast. Picture in your mind I drive a 2008 Mercedes-Benz has tinted windows and 22-inch rims. It's air ride. It's 36 feet long and holds 66 kids, but it's still a Mercedes-Benz. That quick. I went about the work of getting my missionaries that I support with my money the tools they need to do the job they need to do. We printed... As of 2019, we printed 100,000 John and Romans in Bolivia. Two, two significant things happened then. I got my 100,000 John and Romans when I, were, I was there. I went back to Tiwanaku and got that little girl a John and Romans. As of the day, we started shipping containers into Bolivia, and thanks to Beans, we put 10,000 Bibles into Bolivia. One and a half million John and Romans, four and a half million tracks, and Sunday school material for 30 churches for a lifetime. We worked with about 20 American missionaries in South, all over South America, and we've helped about 200 local churches. So, I mean, right now we're working on a building. We got to have a storage facility in Bolivia, but uh, I'm just a school bus driver from Indiana. I'm not a professional at this. I, I don't have any formal training whatsoever. But, you know, that's, that's, that's what I do with my spare time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Todd Steele. My wife, Ginger, we're from Trinity Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. God has sent us to, to be missionaries to local churches in the United States of America. Uh, we went on full-time deputation in 17, raised our support in, in 19, and uh, we live in the fifth wheel full-time. We've been on the road ever since, and uh, we just uh, came back from September. We left September of last year, just got home to the mailbox and, uh, and stopped in and got the mail, but uh, Brother Mark asked us to come, and we've enjoyed being here, but uh, our ministry is, uh, I am from the business world, but I don't teach churches how to be a CEO. But uh, we, what we do is we go in, we go into a church, and uh, we come into church, and when, uh, when we come to that church, we, we don't tell the pastor, you know, God didn't call me to be a pastor, God called me to preach, but he didn't call me to be a pastor, and I don't come into the church saying, 
oh, pastor, if you do uh, bus ministry or whatever, that you'll grow your church. That's not what we do. What we do is we come to that pastor and we say, pastor, is there a need in your church? What is that particular need? And whatever that particular need is, we help that pastor fulfill that need. And uh, we, we do anything that that pastor asks us to do, but we specialize in bus ministry, children's ministry, and evangelism. And uh, we just finished a church. Well, we, we stay a maximum of, uh, we say, four Sundays, three full weeks and four Sundays. And uh, we just finished a church in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, and I know some of you all familiar with COVID. COVID has shut down some of the, the soul winning programs in, in our churches. And what we did was we went to Las Cruces and helped them rekindle their soul winning program. We did a, a soul winning training and uh, we took people out during the week and, and the people that had never been soul winning before, we took them out one on one and showed them how to soul win. And we had 27 people come through our soul winning training and we, we seen seven people saved. And, uh, and God's using us. We love it. And if you know of a church or if you need help in your church or if there's something that you might be interested in us doing, let me know. Uh, we have prayer cards with us. And thank you. Amen. Good morning. I'm Steve Schnell. My wife, Margaret, and I, back in 1993, got interested in missions because our church had been doing Bible studies, and uh, we saw that's what God was doing in the world, was reaching the world with his gospel, and that's what he needed done, and so we saw that out of the word of God, and I always tell people we weren't called. I said, we saw what God was doing, and we said, God, can we help? We volunteered, and uh, ever since then, God's just been saying, can you, can you volunteer here? Can you volunteer there? And so in 1995, we went to Baptist Bible Translators Institute. We went through their nine-month missionary training course. Uh, it's more comprehensive. It's, it's different than Bible school mission courses. Uh, we focus on cross-cultural communication and the skills that you would need in order to speak uh, language, uh, the language of the people uh, fluently and without accent, uh, what it means to learn a culture. And then eventually, uh, where you could go into a language, whether it's written or unwritten, with the skills that we teach, and be able to learn that language and reduce that to writing. So we have a, a language learning course that we teach you. And that's what we did in Cambodia. Instead of going to a language school, we went right to the provinces. I hired a young man who became my language informant, language teacher. And we learned the language that way. Cambodia is a written language. We, we didn't need to reduce that language to writing, but we had the skills to do that. And so we understand how languages work. Uh, with cross-cultural communication, we have to understand the culture. And so we try to teach missionaries about culture shock and uh, different things like that. Our, our missionaries are going to the foreign field and uh, just being blindsided by how different things are, uh, just even in our own country. And so culture shock, understanding what's happening and what's going on, and under, uh, being able to study the culture helps reduce uh, the, the effects of culture shock. And so that, these are different subjects. We teach literacy. We have field medicine. We have Bible translation course. Uh, whether a, a language needs an, a Bible or not, there's usually a Bible there that needs, at least needs to be checked. It needs to be looked at. And so, uh, and other material needs to be translated. Preaching in another language is often instant translation. So there's so many things that we teach there. We're not a mission board. We're not a, uh, a typical mission school. Um, we don't send out missionaries. We're a nine-month course, and uh, we exist to try to help missionaries get to the field and be as effective as they can and to stay on the field, to have the skills they need. We have material back there on our display. And uh, if you're interested in BBTI, we have some information packets. We have some DVDs. Uh, we'd love to be able to come by and let you know more about what we do. Uh, it was started back in 1973. Uh, Rex Cobb is the current director, and uh, he's a veteran missionary from uh, Mexico and Colombia. And uh, one of the models of BBTI is missionaries training missionaries. So it's not just giving out information but it's missionaries teaching the information because they've been there, they've done that, and, and maybe in our case, we, we made the mistakes, so we, we'll try to help you so you don't make the same mistakes we did. So anyhow, give us a, 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 a just check us out on the web or, or check out our video or come talk to me later on. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
My name is Justin Bushy. My family, uh, Kristen, Bentley, Bella, Bronx, Blaze, and Boaz, and Brightland will be here in July. And we are missionaries serving with Rock of Ages Ministries sent out of Calvary Baptist Church in Union Grove, North Carolina. It's Pastor Steve Pope. And our heart and our burden is to reach those that are incarcerated here in America. Um, folks, I ask you a question today. If it was your mom, if it was your dad, your son, or your daughter, would you not want someone going and giving them the gospel? Right now, there's over 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States. Texas is the highest number in the entire world for the incarcerated for population. Over 150,000 in Texas alone. Folks, it burns my heart to even get up here and talk about this because it's a desire of mine not to be in a church but to be in a prison. I want so badly to be back in, and praise the Lord, Texas just opened their doors this week to let our people back into revival teams so we can start, and they're booked out all the way through October. So we praise the Lord for that. But our heart and our burden is to reach mom and dad. Brother Pope didn't realize what he was preaching on last night that it affected me, the jailhouse, because I'm here to tell you I've been a person that was in a jailhouse when I was 17 years old, so I know what it's like. But can I tell you this? Uh, my heart and my burden is still for Acts chapter number 16 where it says that you reach mom and dad. Folks, if we'll reach dad, we can reach the house. We see that it's implemented and preached last night. We seen that uh, by Brother Davison last night when he preached on men becoming men, taking over the house. And I say this over and over again. If I can reach dad in a prison cell, I can reach the house. I may not necessarily go pray in a church, but if I can reach one man, he gets out, he's going to go back and he's going to reach his family. Because right now, 77% of all people that are incarcerated are going to go right back in. That number is so bad. But we can do, we can have something to do with that, and that is we can go in and we can give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter three, verse number nine says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count, as some man count slackness, but is long suffering towards us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I don't care the color of your skin. I don't care the background. I don't care where you've been. You can be a murderer, a rapist, you can be a, a thief. It doesn't make a difference to me because I see your soul. And that soul is what Christ is looking at. He's looking for an individual. He's looking for someone that, that's willing to accept him as Savior. And without taking our Bible and giving them the gospel, how would they ever know? And so God's burden, our family, uh, we're still on deputation, been full-time for over a year now, and we praise the Lord. He's been good to us. God's been more than good to us. He's been great to us. And we thank him. We thank you, Pastor Mark, for allowing us this minute. We thank you all so much for uh, listening to us this morning. But please do pray for us. Our prayer card's back there. Uh, we appreciate your prayers as we continue to go for, uh, for Christ. Thank you so much. Good stuff. Thank you, guys. Uh, one more thing before I forget. I forgot to tell you last night. There's a table out there in the foyer. Uh, the little blue bags, and these are courtesy of uh, Dr. Butch Lockhart. He brought these with you. These are cool. Um, they've got mints in them and good pens. Y'all like a good pen? You know what I mean by the good? These pens are actually in plastic, okay? So they've got nice pens in them, information about beams, and uh, nice little leather pads, okay? So really neat packets. These are our gift to you, and I apologize folks that came last night and didn't know they could take one uh so as long as they'll last I, I just you know maybe one per family until we kind of see who's got one but these are for you and uh, so sometime today run back there and get you one off the table in the foyer all right having said that uh uh i i love the i'm kind of partial to one of them up here i think she's pretty cute uh but i'm gonna have my wife i believe my wife and my sister-in-law and uh, my two favorite nieces are going to sing for you now just before Dr. Pope comes and preaches. Do what? I said, do you hurt Chesney's feelings? I hurt Chesney's feelings? Oh. <laughs> I like Chesney, too. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to brag on whoever's doing something for you at the time. That's how that works, right? She's healthy. <laughs> Uh, but they, they have beautiful voices, beautiful harmony, and uh, I wanted them to sing for you. And so they're going to sing, and when they're done, uh, Dr. Pope, you come preach for us. Okay. From the manger where he lay to the garden where he prayed I'd often heard about this stranger Then I opened up my heart And he walked into my life Now we're not strangers anymore For he's my friend
I had heard about this man who could even raise the dead. I heard he'd calm the troubled waters, but I never thought for me he would calm the raging sea. But all I do is call his name. Why not give this man a try, for even now he's passing by. You won't be strangers anymore, he'll be your friend and your Lord. Oh, how you love him as your father. Then you'll Okay, don't joke with Pope. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Doing okay, Caleb? Caleb, uh, you know, I pastored him when he was a single young man as a second lieutenant. You made it to captain yet? Uh, yeah, you're still first lieutenant though, right? Uh, okay, ura or whatever you guys say. Uh, ura, ura, ura. I know one. I got Marines in my church that get very temperamental about the say you, way you, one pronounce. Matter of fact, I've had Marines say, Pastor, I love you, but don't say whatever the Marines say, because you're not a Marine. You know, you're just, oh, great. But anyway, uh, I'm like Brother Davison. I, 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 I've admired uh, the armed forces all my life. I wanted to go to West Point. Closest I got to is one of our kids graduated from there and wanted me to pray with him at uh, the chapel at West Point. I got to do that, and that was nice, but that's as close as I've gotten right there. Um, so a lot of things are in my mind. So anyway, Brother Smith, we're benefits, we're beneficiaries, okay, <clears throat> of marrying godly girls that were reared in godly homes. One of the saddest things that I've ever seen in my life is to see great godly men. I remember years ago there was um, someone that was working for me for a period of seven years and uh, they were single with me before they came into the church and, um, and, so, uh, and so we had agreed on this is the direction we're going, this, these, these, these are our standards and things like this. And I remember how that through the years after he had gotten married, they kept changing and changing and changing and changing. And I, I wish that that was uh, not the case. But so oftentimes it is. And uh, boys, I want to tell you something. If we, don't marry, if we don't marry the right girl, boy, it can be trouble. Um, Brother Davison didn't ask me to say what I'm about to say, but I just feel led because one reason uh, 
you know, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I was, I'm, you ever get two things in your mind at the same time and you don't know which direction to go? One reason it's a little bit late, I'm late everywhere anyway, but uh, I want you to pray about something. My, my father's track, Watch Your Answer, uh, when he was in the American Baptist Assassination, I mean Association, he had written that track and, um, and later on years went by and his dad was an older man. They said more people have been saved off that track than all of the tracks of an American Baptist Association print in total. Uh, matter of fact, Renee was telling me some years ago, remember, there was a man that was digging through the garbage to find something to eat. And he found that one of my dad's tracks had been thrown away and it was crumpled. And Brother Gary, he picked it up out of the trash, straightened it out, read it, got saved, <laughs> got to making money again, enough to get a, a stamp and put it on the letter, sent the track back to Deems and said, I read this and got saved. He was digging through the trash to find something to eat and found the bread of life. Isn't that great? So we're, we're, we're in the process now of redesigning the cover and the illustrations, and the, but the context of my dad's track has never changed. So Mark's working on this now in Washington State, and so we hope to get 10,000 right away. But um, Daddy told me years ago there was anointing of Ford Porter's track, you know, you know, God's simple plan of salvation. He prayed over that, and hundreds of thousands have been saved off God's simple plan of salvation. Even one of Hitler's bodyguards read that and got saved. Uh, there's the same anointing over Dad's track. I'm telling you, that thing is unbelievable. So anyway, pray for us because we, we, it's now we're in the fourth proof copy. And so we were reading it this morning, and my wife found two periods out of place. And I thought, I can't believe this. So I feel like, the, you know, we're in spiritual warfare in these days, aren't we? So pray about that. Now, so that was in my mind. I want to get it out of the way. So I want you to pray for uh, what's your answer? You know, if you die, do you know you go to heaven? That, that was basically the question. But I want to say a word because the Lord has been good as I've traveled from one part of the country to the other and preached in most of, most of the independent fundamental Bible colleges from uh, Bob Jones University to West Coast, from Hiles Anderson, which is my uh, alma mater, uh, to uh, uh, Landmark for my good friend, Mickey Carter. Uh, I mean, yeah, and I, and I thank the Lord for this. Um, but I'm really concerned. There's a lot of things that are happening. So Brother Davison didn't ask me to say this, but I just feel led to say this. I'm going to say thank God for you, Brother Davison. Yeah, and I want to say thank God for Heartland. Yeah. Because, yeah, you know, now some of our kids have gone to the conferences, but <laughs> I'm sorry to say, sir, I've, I've never stepped foot on your campus. But what I'm about to say is because of the results that I've seen. As the missionaries have come through, as the young men and young ladies have graduated from that college, I watch them. I hear what they're saying, and I see where they are when they get out of school, and I see where they end up a couple years later. I could not believe it. Um, I wrote an article about why we are total abstainers. And from nearly every major college, Bible college in America, let me rephrase that, fundamentalist college, I've had, it seemed like from most all of the colleges, I had alumni, um, alumni, excuse me, uh, I didn't major in grammar, uh, write me or email me telling me how antiquated I am and how I've missed it on the business of drinking alcohol. I mean, I'm astounded. I, I never got one letter from Heartland graduate, not one. And so Wednesday night, I spoke uh, a simple subject on uh, why, you, at this time of the year it happens, you know, girls are ordering their culottes, getting ready for youth camp, and somewhere along the line, some parents come out of the woodwork, and I remember one mother came into my office and said, nobody's telling my daughter what she's wearing. I said, well, you're the parent, you can tell them what to wear where, uh, where, wherever you want to. But if they're in this church and they're going there, our youth camp, then the pastor's going to set the standards. I said, ma'am, somebody's got to set the standard, so it might as well be the pastor, you know. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 7, Hebrews 13, 17. Uh, so Wednesday night, I just kind of, I, you know, just paid my tribute to why. We're, one, one of our very educated people in our, in, our, in, our, in our church said, why must our daughters wear these contraptions? That's what he called it. And so uh, last night, I, I gave a, a message last night on why 
our, Lord, our, our ladies, uh, why we have a conviction against ladies wearing slacks. I mean, I wasn't mean, I wasn't unkind, but my phone has been burning up. Because nowadays you're online, whatever you're saying is going out there. So I just, uh, I, I just want to say God bless you and Heartland College for the great standard that is still being upheld. And I do believe that there is a correlation between our effectiveness as soul winners and prayer warriors on this matter of holiness. Holiness goes hand in hand with effective evangelism. And we're crying out for revival. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that are getting crowds, many of them, but, but check it out. I mean, where, where, where are the tears and where's the conversions and where are the life-changing stories? Uh, it, I mean, for, for a person making a profession of faith and, and they can still dance and they can still drink and they can still, I, I say something's wrong here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me just say this. Let me just say this. I, I, this, this, this. So I want to say thank you, Brother Davis. And now I just want to say this, okay? I have written an article, Why? Uh, is drinking alcohol wrong, okay? Why do we take that stand? And also on modest apparel about why we have this conviction about, you know, having, having a dress standard, okay? And um, so if you would like that, if you'll give me your email, I will email you the article I wrote on alcohol and dress standards, and, and uh, I, I'd love to do that. And I'm very, very burdened. Uh, I, I was so worked up over Wednesday night's message. I thought, you ever done this, Brother Davis? And you're still worked up over it. You go to the next conference, and the Lord gives you permission just to keep staying there. And I thought, truly, if ever I'd be preaching to the choir, I'd be this group right here. I'm looking at all these gray-haired men and ladies, and you're already set, okay? But uh, the Lord knows. Um, uh, matter of fact, the article that I wrote on modesty was I was asked by a leading Bible college, do you have any suggestions for us? And I said, yeah, you yeah. know. And so, uh, anyway, it was nice preaching there, too. But anyway, uh, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, so, so if, you wanna, if you want those two articles, and, and let me just say this. Um, I, I don't think it's great writing, but it's just filled with Scripture. And that's what, we heard it last night, that is so true. I didn't get permission from Bill Gates or Steve Jobs on what I should say about that. And I like what uh, the brother said about being a businessman. By the way, I enjoyed all the testimonies today, but I was thinking about Brother Bushy this morning. Am I saying that right, Bushy? Okay. I have often just been kidding, saying, how many would rather be here in the best jail in town? And everybody would raise their hand except Brother Bushy. He'd say he'd rather be in jail. But that's ministry. Thank you uh, so much, Arthur. And I'm calling Butch Arthur because I think it sounds just so dignified, you know. Of course, wearing that bow tie today, you look like Butch. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I like that bow tie, and, and, I, and, I, and I like to wear mine every now and then. Okay, I have a, matter of fact, I have a state of Texas bow tie. Got the star on one side and the white and the red, uh, white and the blue on the other side. By the way, it's white and blue, okay? All right, I thought I'd share that with you. You know, boy, I'm seeing some heads nodding out there. I pastored a retired lieutenant colonel, I mean, total Texan. Three bronze stars, three silver stars. If he saw somebody with the Texas flag and the blue was on top, he would pull over. And if they didn't take it down, he would take it down. I mean, you know, remember the Alamo. That's what I'm talking about. Did you bring your Bibles today? Okay, look at, I am looking, I can't see, you know, I, need, I got cataracts nowadays, and they are messing with me a little bit. I know some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And a few years ago, I didn't know what I was talking about either. Um, you know, I have a whole new appreciation for aging nowadays, huh? How about you? You know you're getting older when you lean over to tie your shoe and you ask yourself, anything else I can do while I'm down there? <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, it's a trip just to get back up, amen? Gary, you're laughing real big there, amen. All right, good deal. Gary Winters was my dad's pastor when he left heaven, left for heaven from this earth. So, um, but he did go to heaven from where he wanted to go to heaven, Texas, amen? <laughs> That's right, brother. Okay, and some of you knew my mama. I, I know the true girls all knew my mama. Three years ago, she, she uh, died in my arms. My father died in our house, and we have one remaining parent. She is 22 steps from our back door, right next door. Brother, I'm telling you. She has me jumping. Anyway, um, listen, that's one reason my wife doesn't travel with me as much. We've got to watch Mama. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And uh, I think it's been a while since you stood up, so let's go ahead and stand up. Out of reverence for the Word of God, let us stand up, okay? 
You know what? I shouldn't kid around like that because it's really, really great, you know. You know, there's something that I've heard some formal pastors say sometimes uh, when they get through reading the scripture, and I think it's probably more of a Presbyterian thing or, or Church of England thing than anything, but I, but I do like this. They'll read the Word of God and they'll say, this is the Word of God, and I like that, you know. Okay, one of you, okay. Okay, I usually don't say it because I don't want to be, every time I open my mouth to say something that sounds a little different, somebody says, I knew he's Presbyterian, you know. No, I'm not. Listen, I was reared in old landmarkism, right, Gary? I can only go so far, brother, I'm telling you. Daddy was married by Ben M. Bogart and D.N. Jackson. I mean, I got landmark roots, amen. If you don't even smell like Baptist, I'm getting scared, okay? Probably one reason we shouldn't have changed our name. But anyway, uh, we're still Baptist in our name, okay? All right, I just wanted you to mind, anyway. That's another story. I wanted to go Calvary Baptist, but... but Houston's got everything first and second, Calvary this, Calvary that, Grace this, Grace that. So anyway, we've got a lot, a lot of church names, I'll tell you. James chapter 5, oh, I put it, Brother Smith, okay, pick a Smith, any Smith. Uh, I really need to know when I need to stop here, okay? I don't, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem, okay? All right? Okay? All right, well, then I'm shooting from the hip. I'm going to shoot for half hour. I may go beyond that. Okay, I'm going to do my best, okay, because honestly, I did understand that Brother Davison has to go this afternoon, so if I would say anything that would, like right now, shoot in the breeze, that would shorten his message, I want to just shut up so that the king can come up to the throne here. Okay, there we go. James chapter 5, verse number 13. I see a lot of you had Schofields. I could hear it, right? My hope is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and references. I dare not trust the Thompson chain, but wholly lean on Schofield's name. Isn't that horrible? Yeah, for those of you that had Thompson chain. Okay, I know the notes aren't inspired. I know he wasn't Baptist. Okay, give me a break, all right? Okay, anyway. But that's what I got started on. In other words, you could start on the Bible, and I get all these great new Bibles and everything. Wonderful. But my Bible, my Schofield's, I know where this is and I know where that is. I'm apologizing for being who I am. So anyway, James 5, verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth fruit. Brethren, if, brethren, if any uh, of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then please be seated. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the music today, with the word of God from yesterday, from your servant, Brother Davison. And we expect to be blessed again from the Word of God today. And we need that, that cleansing power of the precious Word of God. Thank you for that. We thank you for these missionaries and their bold stand for the Lord and their willingness to sacrificially do what God's called them to do with or without support. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help us to love thee more. Please help me in this message, Lord uh, I would ask you for some shoe leather Christianity today, something we can walk in and use. And we promise to give you the praise and glory. Give me wisdom and guidance from the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you today about the importance of prayer. Now, I, I, again, I know that we all believe in prayer. Every one of us believe in prayer. But it is the one thing that we all believe in, but we have a hard time practicing that as we should. Isn't it amazing that this great passage about Elias and his prayer life, or uh, Elijah, same guy, isn't it amazing how that just before that it had talked about how that 
prayer. It was so important that somebody could be sick and you could pray for them and God in his sovereignty has chosen prayer to change the course of that person's failing health. It's an amazing thing. And then right after that, I talked about a person that if they are erring from their way, we can, by God's help, effectively guide that person back into scriptural discipleship. And how's between a prayer that could help a person who is sick even dying have the course of their trajectory change, and then on the other hand, a person that has gotten so worldly uh, you know, I preached a message once why every saved person should be converted. You know, this was written to save people. Remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter? And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. So I know that conversion, there is a good term for using that for salvation, but also there's a good term for using that for the, for, for the Christian who is not where he or she needs to be. They need to be fully converted to that dedicated life what I would like to call the perfect will of God, Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know what, I'm going to tell you something. There's just a lot of compromise these days, and there's a lot of people, and I've even heard them say, you know, well, uh, I, I don't believe in the perfect will of God. It's either the will of God or not. No, I, I've, I've known people that are saved that have made wrong decisions, and they missed the perfect will of God for their life, you know. I mean, you think about this. I mean, the Bible says that the bishop must be the husband of one wife. That's not one at a time. And I've known of young men that have been called. I knew in my heart of heart, called to preach, and they just married prematurely, and the girl left them, and they got remarried, and now they're forfeited from being what they ought to be. And I think that we're scared to preach that truth because it is truth. Otherwise, he would have never said that you may prove what is that, what good, that, that acceptable, that perfect will of God. I mean, if something can be perfect, there's something that's not so, quite so perfect. Be perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. There's a lot of Christians that are not living that perfected life, that mature life. Well, anyway, I'm getting beside myself here. What I want you to see here uh, in verse number 17, it says, well, Elias was a man, I love this, subject to like passions as we are. Too many times we think that prayer is relegated only to what we would maybe term super saints, unusual Christians, the George Muellers, the Lester Roloffs. You know what I'm talking about. John R. Rice's. That, 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 that's, that kind of prayer life, that Elijah prayer, that, that the fire comes down from heaven, you know. That, that's Elijah, that's people in the Bible, but that's not me. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that Elijah is a man subject to like passions, with the same kind of temptations, with the same kind of shortcomings. My goodness, I think that if a person even had a tendency to be bipolar, you can look at uh, Elijah under the juniper tree and say, hey, he's not much different from me, right? I mean, he's wanting to die. He knew he didn't have permission to kill himself, but if the Lord had chosen to do it for him, I'm in. Take me out, God. That's pretty sick, isn't it? That's not right thinking. That's stinking thinking right there, right? Why in the, how in the world can such a spiritual man, I mean, look at this, Brother Dennis. Just hours before, He's praying with such power that fire from God Almighty comes down the Carmel. Hours later, he's under a tree, not exactly practicing what Brother Davison preached last night. Takes out over 400 prophets, but one woman gets mad at him, and he's running, baby. Now there's a man. <laughs> OBR Lake, and you say, I knew a guy that was so hidden pecked he had to roost in the head of the bed at night. <laughs> One guy said, I had my wife on her knees the other day. She was on her knees trying to get me out from under the bed, but I showed her as the man. I stayed under the bed. Amen. That's Elijah. He's running from Jezebel. What a man. Uh uh. Like passions. 
He had fear. He had worry. He had doubts. Isn't it amazing how God uses people that are full of shortcomings? You know the greatest statement of any disciple who followed Jesus about the deity of Christ? The greatest statement? It didn't come from Simon Peter. Now, don't get me wrong. What a statement. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say you're John the Baptist, Elias. You know, John the Baptist come back to life. And I love what Jesus said. But whom do ye say that I am? And you know, he's still asking that question today. Jesus knows what the world thinks about him. But what do you think about me? Isn't that good? And then Simon Peter, all of a sudden, man, he comes out with a great statement. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, well, he didn't say, well, but I kind of think that he, he might have thought, whoa. <laughs> Flesh and blood have not revealed in thee, but my Father which is in heaven. What a statement. But the greatest statement of deity, by far and away, was after Jesus had risen from the grave and, 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 and Thomas said he wouldn't believe unless, right? And then when Jesus presented himself specifically to, to Thomas, Thomas said, uh, my Lord and my God. That's the greatest statement of deity for any, any follower of Jesus. He looked straight at Jesus and said, my Lord, my God. And by the way, Jesus didn't correct him because he got a right, didn't he? Hey, you want to know something I read some years ago? And it's only speculation, but I think it's, 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 it's kind of neat. Um, you know, he's called Didymus. We're the ones that nicknamed him T Thomas, Doubting Thomas. You know that, don't you? God didn't call him Doubting Thomas. God called him Didymus, right? Didymus. You know what Didymus means? It means twin. And so I don't remember exactly what book I was reading when I read this, but I thought that was interesting. But one source of history speculated that he was called the twin because he looked so much physically like Jesus. His gait, his walk was so much like Jesus that he was called the twin. And when Judas led the multitude, the, the, well, you know, the, you know, the guards and stuff, to, to pick up Jesus, one reason he had to go and specifically point out Jesus because Thomas looked just like him. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. By the way, isn't it interesting that someone that would look just like Jesus and walk just like Jesus would be so filled with doubts because his testimony would be so dangerous? You know? Now that's total speculation. There's not an ounce of biblical stuff to back that up other than Didymus, the twin. Of course, now I'm getting a little bit more dogmatic. He was called the twin. You know, if somebody was called the twin, that means they're not the most famous one. They're the twin of the most famous one. Well, who's the famous one? Yeah. Yeshua. What? Okay, now see, I got more dogmatic. I didn't need to do that. I'm nervous because Sam Davis isn't here. I just want to tell you that right now. I'm going to get over this, and, I, and I'll do a lot better tonight when you're gone, okay? But uh, <laughs> that's horrible to say, isn't it? Oh, I'm still just a hero worshiper in this pitiful. The fear of man's a snare. I ain't afraid of you. Much. Okay, here we are. So Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Everybody says we are. Everybody say we are. That's you. And then it says, and he prayed earnestly. And so it said it didn't rain, and then it did rain. But if you'll ease up to what it says in verse number 16... After it said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed, it says, watch this, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. My friend, that is for you. That is for me. Otherwise, it would have never said he was a man of like passions, so he says in his word, God is telling us, don't say that you can't pray like Elijah because he's basically just like you and me. But the effectual, fervent prayer of any man or woman who will pray with effectiveness, with effectualness, it avails much. Oh, to get to that much. To pray the price in such a way that things really do change. I basically have two points. Why is prayer important? Number one, Prayer is important because prayer was important to Jesus. Look at Mark chapter 1. We'll go real quickly here, but look at Mark chapter 1. All right, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. One of my favorite courses in Bible college was 
the harmony of the Gospels. Just love that course. Matter of fact, one of the greatest delights I ever had as a pastor was teaching chronologically through the, through the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That was really a fun, fun trip. It really was to study Jesus and to study his life. Um, and if you remember, those of you that have the harmony, you remember this is called uh, Mark chapter 1, the busy day at Capernaum. The reason it was called the busy day at Capernaum was because um, he has more miracles mentioned on this day, it appears, than in any other day in his ministry. That, that, that doesn't mean that it was so, but it was just those who have studied the gospel said this was the busy day at Capernaum. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency on busy days to find every excuse I can on why I could and should sleep in. It appears that Jesus didn't take that philosophy. For after the busy day at Capernaum, knows what it says in verse number 34, uh, chapter 1 of Mark, the, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and he healed many that were sick <clears throat> of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Uh, they still do, don't they? And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So he got up and found that secret place early the next morning, in the early morning, and he prayed. Look at Matthew chapter 14, and now we move into the middle part of Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Notice what it says over here. Matthew chapter 14. All right. Matthew 14, look at verse number 22, please. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he just fed the 5,000, not counting the women and the children, with five loaves and two fishes. And when he had sent the multitudes away, verse 23, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, before we go further, let me, let me bring something to your mind right now. So the busy day at Capernaum, he healed many, did great ministry. Do you remember one time a woman touched him, the hem of his garments, and Jesus said, who touched me? And the disciples said, in essence, well, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. No, but someone had touched him by faith because he perceived, here it is, that virtue had gone out of him. That's a great word. In Greek, that's taken from the word dynamis. Does that sound strangely familiar? That's where we get the word dynamite from. He had perceived the dynamic power it had gone out from him. Uh, after Capernaum's busy day, he had ministered, 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 gave out, gave out, gave out. He had just fed the 5,000, not counting women and children, and he got up on the mountain to pray. So we see a pa pattern. Jesus could have done all the miracles by who he was as the second person of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son. But he chose to do all of his miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is damnation. Because everything he was doing was through the Holy Spirit. To go against the Holy Spirit was to go against God. To reject Jesus was to reject the convicting of the Holy Spirit. Remember the Word of God? That you do always resist the Holy Ghost. You know, there's your unpardonable sin. Resisting the Holy Ghost. Resisting the expression of God in the earth. So, so anyway, going back to this, so Jesus did all the miracles of the Holy Spirit. Remember what he told us? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. He came into his own, his own received them not, but to as many as, re, what? What's the word there? Re, received him to them, gave he what? Power. Can I do a parenthetical off that great sermon that we heard last night? Too many times, and you can go into bookstores, when they used to have bookstores that were open, and you could see not one row, but you could see several rows dedicated to self-help. And here's, here's the, what, you can say it in one sentence, here's what most all the self-help teaches, whether it's self-help, in the business world or self-help in the pulpit. Here's the philosophy. What the mind of man can conceive, he can achieve. What the mind of man can conceive, <laughs> you better watch out about the mind of man. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Better watch out for your mind. Casting down imaginations. It's interesting to see what that word imagination is from, the word logikos. Does that sound familiar? Now it is tied to the word logos or logos, but here the word there is logikos, casting down, this is interesting, 2 uh, uh, Corinthians 10, remember? Casting down your own logic. 
Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring in the captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So here's what happens, whether it's in the CE world, world, EEO world or the ministerial world, what the philosophy is, let's be great achievers. Let's, and here's a phrase I hear a lot of. Do you ever hear this? Hey, let's make it happen. And that's exactly what's happening. We're making it happen. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why so much hell prevailing against people today? Because the candlestick's been taken out of the way. By the way, if the candlestick's out, then that means they're not lifting up the light of the world. Yes, a church may stop being a church, my friend. All right? But anyway, when, when, and if it's not a church, gates of hell can prevail against it. But as long as Jesus is there, you know what I mean? As long as he's not Laodicea, and, uh, treating us like Laodicea, he's outside knocking to get in. Look at, see, God's not looking for great achievers. There are a dime a dozen. God's looking for great receivers. See, receivers have to be humble. I have often said this, I believe it now more than ever. If there, if there is a logical human reason for why God's blessing you, it may not be God. God relishes using people and churches where the human explanation is out the window. That no flesh should glory in its presence. Amen? God's looking for people who give him the glory. I heard one sentence this, describing the glory of God. Ready? The glory of God. Here it is. The display of God. Is that good? It's simple. The display of God. When we're in the business of displaying who he is, what he has done, and what he can do, get ready for the blessing. Well, anyway, I see something that Jesus is teaching us. He gives out, and then he gets into that secret place. He chose to do all the miracles of the Holy Spirit. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall what? Receive power. The reason a lot of us wipe out the reason, reason a lot of us give out, the reason a lot of us burn out is because we give out and we forget that it's in the prayer place that we take back in. Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a continuing thing. Be filled, be filled and be filling, be filled and be filling. Ask and keep asking. 